Welcome to the Shooting Show. This week we cover a pest control problem with a difference. Stuart Wilson and I head out with the Brownings to reduce a rook population in North Yorkshire. Plus Byron reviews the Ruger American. The 5th of May is a traditional day to take care of the branching rooks and Stuart Wilson and I aren't about to miss out. We've headed to a local rookery that's teeming with a huge population of branches and adults causing crop damage and raiding cattle rations. This promises to be a big evening of sport so we've brought as much Ely VIP ammunition as we can carry between us. 30, 32, 32 is okay. We start the proceedings by glassing our quarry from long range to establish the plan of attack. It is absolutely black with them, and, hey, and all over the lower branches as well, not just on the tops. Spot on. Hundreds of them, hundreds. There's no use waiting any longer. We suit up, grab the shotguns and head for the rookery. Even as we begin our approach, the sound of rooks overhead is already at an impressive volume. These are some serious numbers. So, Mr Carr, we're walking towards this rather noisy wood. The plan for today? Well, Stuart, the problem is uh, the rooks are coming into the, the cow sheds there and uh, there's too many of them. Uh, also, there's a, a drilled field of peas uh, two fields away and the rooks are mobbing that, pulling up the young seedlings. So, uh, uh, there's too many of them. We're just going to uh, cull a few back. The adult rooks circle overhead as we head into the trees. The young branches are not quite as strong on the wing and should make for some willing targets. We waste no time in readying guns and ammo and make sure to grab just one or two more Ely shells than Stuart does. We're having a bit of a sportsman's competition here, old Caitlin. As always, Mr Wilson, as always. And of course we've brought our shotguns of choice too. I've gone for my trusted over and under while Stuart opts for the three shots of the Browning A5. All set, we turn our attentions to the birds overhead and it doesn't take long until I get a first target of the day within range. That's one in the bag, and a stationary branch soon makes it two. This is a pest control operation. We must be methodical in our approach and cover the whole rookery. And before I know it, the birds are coming in just as fast as I can reload. Only a few yards away, Stuart is having a good time of things too. He's soon making use of all three shots his semi-auto provides. We're using the semi-auto Browning A5. Um, I do like the extra shot, the third shot. Sometimes, it, you know, particularly when you're on a busy day like this, shooting rooks, it's you know nice to have an extra shot. Um, Ely cartridges as well. Again, um, always sort of perform very well, um, and there's been quite a few to go at, so. Been a been a real real good day and cap with the Browning A5 as usual. A few more branches hit the ground in quick succession. So far, the evening is going exactly as planned. We're getting through, them, aren't we? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We think if we push underneath this this next group. Yeah. I think we must have had four out oh, of over one. Stuart, over, one over, over, over. The... Good shot. Oh, that was a beauty. <laughs> well done. There's another two under there, actually. Can you see them under that one? Yeah. And that one there. I honestly thought that we'd have to split up here, but I don't think they're as far on. 
they're, they're, not, they're not flying off. They're, they're flying up and then they're getting tired and they're coming back down. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's better if we just work it, work it through and work yeah. it round, do the yeah. whole rookery. And make sure we, we, we cover our yeah. bases really. It'd be a good number of years since he's he's had a clear out like this, won't it? Just because uh, yeah. of the cattle. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just built up to uh, you know pest proportions, really. Yeah. The birds are so abundant, we can't even manage a conversation in between shots. So why bother? Less talking and more shooting. That's the way we like it. The bag steadily improves as the evening wears on. With the branches suitably controlled, we contemplate a last minute assault on the adult rooks before darkness falls. Before that, we collect the spoils and decide to take one last opportune brancher. It's starting to get dark now. We've worked the rookery through. You know, we've done it like a chessboard, piece by piece. Uh, we've given them a good go. Uh, as night falls, hopefully the adults will start coming in. So, you know, yeah. we'll give them uh, merry hell. Uh, if you go down to the south end there, I'll stay here and it uh, should make them come back and forth a yeah. bit. And uh, they're not happy with us, they're shouting like hell, aren't they? Sorry. Yeah, they're not happy at all, but uh, hopefully uh, that'll be our uh, finale. Yeah, great stuff, it's been a nice day. Well, uh, let's finish it off in style. Yeah. We head our separate ways and I send the camera to follow Stuart. There's not much time left in the day and this will only be a short session, but Stuart doesn't seem bothered and quickly gets on with the task at hand. <laughs> Making full use of his time on the Browning Air 5, Stuart makes quick work of the adult rooks. Not that I'm doing badly myself, mind. The sun soon sets in a well-executed pest control exercise. That, crucially, has made a dent into the avian marauders' excessive numbers. The maize and pea crops will be safer, as will the cattle sheds. Well, Stuart, that concludes uh, quite an interesting evening at the Rooks. Uh, we shot 25, 30-ish, mm. uh, picked most of them. Our cover's yeah. quite high. Uh, we've picked uh, a selection of the plumpest ones. Mm -hmm. And I believe you're going to uh, cook us a Rook pie. We'll have a stab at that, definitely, yeah. And the rest have gone to, to, or will go to Young Will's Ferrets. Uh, so, yeah, I think we could sum it up as a successful evening. Yeah. This has been vital work. There are some rooks left in the trees to ensure a healthy population, but it has been a successful pest control exercise. It's a job well done, and we can start looking forward to that rook pie. Teamwork paying dividends there at the rooks. And now, the shooting show news. This is the Shooting Show News, with the CLA Game Fair less than 10 weeks away. Black grouse are thriving in certain areas, according to conservationists. Numbers of male black grouse are rising sharply on estates where woodland has been restored, such as the Glen Finglas estate in the Trossachs. In fact, numbers have risen by 50% since 2009. A state ranger, Ewan Hills, said black grouse are magnificent birds and the numbers recorded were promising. More on this story in the next issue of Modern Gamekeeping. The British Schools and Young Shots Championship saw well in excess of 300 school pupils shoot across three courses at EJ Churchill on Saturday. Alex Wilkinson of Brian Lees High School won the Clive Stanton Memorial Trophy with a score of 43 on the red course, while the top team represented Kingham High School. Bloxham School dominated the blue course, while Eleanor Thwaites of Millfield School led the ladies team to victory on the way to her own winning score. Brody Woolard won the under-14s course High Gun, and Maidwell School was the winning team after a tense shoot-off. Full results on the Clay Shooting Magazine website. There was an unexpected winner in the Handicap Classic final at Royal Berkshire Shooting School on Wednesday. The competition sees entrants shoot on a handicap system that gives hobby shooters just as much chance of winning as AAA class stars. 74-year-old Alan Payne won the high-gun prize of a Browning Heritage Hunter worth £5,600 on a score of 82, plus the handicap of 14. We spoke to him after the win. So congratulations on, on your win. Um, uh, did you expect to come here today and, and win a brand new Browning? 
Not expected, but I was looking forward to it. You're looking forward to it. How did you enjoy today's shoot? Absolutely brilliant. It's the best I've shot since during the qualifying. I shot better than the qualifiers. You enjoy these sorts of shoots where you get a handicap system? Coming down to qualify is, is, is so important because you can come again and again and improve your shooting as you go along. The government has rejected calls to introduce a licensing system for gamekeepers and upland grouse moors. An online petition calling for a licence amassed just over 10,000 signatures, meaning a government response was called for. In that response, the government said current conservation policies were working and there was no need for further restrictions. Officials described shooting as a legitimate activity and mentioned the conservation benefits it provides. And finally, there could be good news when it comes to using lead shot overseas. Political parties in Norway have pledged to overturn a ban on lead shot, which has been in place since 2005. Shooters have raised objections to the ban ever since, but a number of statements of support now mean repeal would have a clear majority in a parliamentary vote. Shooting organisations said they hoped the move could have implications for other countries where lead bans were being considered. That was the Shooting Show News. Through Sporting Rifle and the Shooting Show, I get the chance to shoot a lot of different rifles. The entire spectrum from budget rifles to the most expensive rifles that money can buy. But what I have realised is that recently I've not spent a lot of time on the budget end of the market. And it's important because not everybody can afford those top end rifles. So this week I bring to you the Ruger American. Now this very much is a budget rifle, less than 500 quid. It costs about the same as a set of detachable mounts for a Mauser M03. Overall impressions of the rifle is it's certainly very light. It's an injection moulded synthetic stock which is very similar in appearance, look and feel uh, to a number of synthetic stocks on other rifles uh, on the market at the moment. It is as you would expect, it's got a very nice slim design. We've got lateral lines on the forestock here. Bring it up, you'll see that your, your thumb and your fingers kind of curl over the edge there, which does give you quite a nice grip. Now before we take the metal work away from the plastic stock and sort of get into the guts of the rifle, let's just have a look at the magazine because that's here. A rotary affair. It stacks the bullets down in a sort of half curve so that you can get, well, in, in, in the case of this, four 308 bullets. It's fitted into the rifle via this little uh, lever at the front here, which basically just clips into place in the stock. Having used this over a couple of days uh, and cycling it many, many times, I've certainly had no problem um, getting the cartridges to come out of the, the magazine and feed into the rifle. So that's been good. So I'll just put that down here. We will now take the stock away from the barrel and receiver so I can show you how the rifle's put together from the inside out. Okay, so we'll start with the inside of the stock. The trigger guard is an integral part of the stock. It'll be part of the, the injection mold that goes into making the stock itself. In terms of bedding, what uh, Ruger have done is try and eliminate the problems with placing um, a metal receiver and barrel into a synthetic stock and that is having sometimes quite flimsy bedding. They've come up with a concept called power bedding. What they've got is two V blocks, one at the front and one to the rear of where the magazine is sitting just in front of the trigger. Now these V blocks correspond to slots in the receiver itself. The two slots here and at the back and the recesses that the power bedding itself actually sit inside. It's very similar in concept to your Tika T3. On the Tika they've got a loose alloy lug which basically just sits loose inside a slot in the plastic stock and that fits inside a groove in the receiver. This is exactly the same as what Ruger are doing here. Um, except they have two um, and they are fixed into the stock itself so they don't sit loose and they fit very snugly and I have to say for a company uh, like Ruger to take this step it is pleasing to see. 
The receiver is nothing we haven't seen before. Uh, it would have started life as a round receiver. It's been milled and angled on top. It's got a, an ejection port on the side. And the, the barrel, which is cold hammer forged, is attached to the receiver via a locking ring. I'm not entirely sure how Ruger go about tightening up their locking ring. It must be with some sort of friction fit, but clearly it's not intended for um, your, your hunter at home to undo the locking ring and remove the barrel. What is interesting from Ruger's point of view is that the Ruger American is a departure from the usual methods that Ruger use to make their rifles. The other rifle models that they have on the market are manufactured with an investment casting process uh, which is to do with how they actually manufacture the steel components of their rifles. With the Ruger American, they've followed what a lot of other rifle manufacturers do, which is to have a milled steel receiver. In terms of the bolt, Ruger have stuck with what they know. And with that, we have a solid bolt shaft. We've got three lugs. What may be familiar to some people, if you look at the back of the bolt, is this plastic bolt shroud, almost identical to the back of a Tika. Like I said when I've reviewed Tika rifles before, is that the bolt shroud, made of plastic, it is one of the components on the rifle that slip, fall, this can end up getting broken. Not the end of the world, you can always get a replacement version, uh, but it would be nice to see this made of metal as well. I know why they've done it on the Ruger American. It's a matter of keeping costs down. The bolt is removed from the rifle via this button on the side here. And if I just slip it back, you will see how that operates. Take this to the back, depress the rear end of the button, and then the bolt slips out. The handle of the bolt is not an integral part of the shaft. You can see here the slot which runs sideways through the shaft itself. I'm not entirely sure how Ruger have gone about um, fitting the bolt to the shaft, uh, but they obviously have some mechanism. It's not removable like you have on a Tika. It is, it is actually fixed in place, but it's a separate component when they're manufacturing it. Cycling the bolt, it's just as smooth as, as you would like. It functions and cycles just like you would expect a very standard uh, bolt action to work. Safety is fitted just above the pistol grip. You've got forward for fire and in its rearwards position it's on safe. It's positioned pretty much where your, your thumb would sit so you don't have to do too much moving around when you decide that you actually want to take the safety off and fire. In terms of noise, as long as you keep a bit of downwards pressure um, into the rifle as you slide it forward, it's almost silent. Um, so that is nice. The last thing that you want is a noisy safety catch. Finally, we get to the trigger. This is another part of the rifle that you may find quite familiar. A number of years ago now, Savage released what they called the AccuTrigger. Now, Ruger have their own version of it called the Marksman. that basically functions in exactly the same way. What we have here is two triggers. We have an internal blade and an external blade. Now for many years, historically speaking, uh, American rifle makers were known for producing some pretty poor triggers. It wasn't entirely their own fault. Regulation over in America meant that they were always on the, the safe side of safe and trigger pools were very heavy and with heavy trigger pools comes creepy triggers. So what the Marksman trigger unit have done is that they've provided a second barrier of safety. But instead of you just pulling a single blade to um, disengage the sear and release the firing pin, first you have to depress the internal blade. Now the internal blade basically blocks the sear from disengaging. So without having this depressed, you have a permanent block sitting there in the way which will not allow the rifle to disengage and the firing pin to fly forward. So if I load this rifle up, put it on fire, the chamber's empty, and I try and depress the um, external blade, pushing down on this pretty hard, the rifle just will not go off. As soon as I depress the internal blade, that block has now been removed. And with the block removed, you're ready to fire it just as you would do any other rifle and you have a nice crisp fire, uh, fire and, and release because 
you're able to set it right on the edge. All that's left now is for us to put some rounds in it, get some rounds downrange and see how she shoots. So that's us finished shooting the Ruger now. First group was this group just off the edge of the paper. I measured it, that was just nicely under an inch, nice triangle group that was at 100 yards. Then we moved it over more into the position that we're looking for. So just above where we're aiming, that's actually two shots almost through the same hole, one off to the side, again, just under the inch. So you can't really complain about that. And I'm sure if I tested a lot more ammunition, you, you would get equally consistent results probably across a few other bullet weights well that's it for this week thanks for watching please don't forget to like us on facebook and follow us on twitter this has been the shooting show